We're going to begin this morning uh, reading our scripture memory verse, which is about to pop up on the screen. And let's read that together. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Let's read together. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Let's say that one more time. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Thank you, worship team. You may be seated. Thank you so much, folks, for being here this morning. I realize it's Labor Day weekend. A lot of our people are traveling, but you're here, and I'm grateful that you're here with us this morning. Let's take our copy of God's Word this morning and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to actually walk through all these verses today. There, I believe there are 18 of them in uh, chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. I want to preach to you today um, using as a theme partnering with God by persevering to the end. Now, many of you know, if you've been tracking with us the last uh, six, seven weeks, we've been in a series called Advance, Building God's Kingdom. And I want to take just a moment before I get into the text this morning uh, to kind of review so that everybody is on the same page. Remember, in our very first sermon, we learned something very important, and that is that we were created to partner with God in the building of His kingdom. Now, congregation, this is huge. I want you to understand, you were not created to watch. You were not created to sit. You were created by God, for God, to partner with God. And so the Bible tells us that God in His sovereign will chose to involve us in saving the lost, in reaching the nations. God has chosen to involve us as His children in the process of building His kingdom on earth. I don't know about you, but... That's overwhelming to me. That's a privilege. In fact, let me just stop and say this. The earthly purpose of salvation is so that you and I can live on mission with God in our world. So that we might co-labor with Him to advance His kingdom uh, on, on earth. And so this is huge. We were created to partner with God in building His kingdom. And because of that, in the second message of this series, we, lo- we learn we should pursue and prioritize the kingdom of God above all else. Many of you may remember the, the passage of Scripture that we memorized all through this is Matthew 6, And it goes something like this, right? Uh, Seek the kingdom of God, remember, above all else. And let me ask you, what does above all else mean? <laughs> it means above all else. It should be our what? Number one priority in life, right? I want to make sure you get that. It should be the focus of your relationship with God. It should be the focus of your relationship with your spouse. So as married couples, we work together to advance God's kingdom on earth. It should be the focus of your parent-child relationships. It should be the focus of our life. The kingdom of God above all else. And now I didn't say the kingdom of America or the kingdom of you. It's the kingdom of God above all else. And then thirdly, in our third stop on the series, we learned that we partner with God through biblical prayer and fasting. How many of you know that God has given us gifts, means of grace to help us be effective in doing what he created us to do? And, and we learned on that first Sunday that the first thing that God gives us is prayer and fasting. And how many of you know that God works through the prayers of his people? And so God calls us to pray, He calls us uh, to uh, be a part of his work through prayer and fasting. In fact, today, this afternoon at five o'clock, we'll have our second circle of prayer in the building, in building D. I'd love for you to come and be a part of that experience. And then we moved a step fur- further in the sermon series. We learned that we partner with God through discipling and sending. Very important that we are discipled. So that we can become disciplers. In other words, God wants to use you to help mentor someone else. Right? Very important part. In fact, if we don't mentor the next generation, right, there won't be one. (laughs) Not a Christian one anyway. Mature one. So God calls us to to become disciplers. That means we, we not only learn how to walk with the Lord, but we're able to help others learn how to walk and follow Jesus. Very important. That's what the rhythms course that we're starting is all about, is to help you in that process. And once we're discipled, God sends us wherever he wants us to go. And then we took another step forward in the series, and we learned that we partner with God through ministry and missions. Now, this is huge. If you're a Christian, God has called you to serve him in the church. And not only has he called you, but he's given you special gifts and abilities. 
Not only in the church, but also in the world. God has called us to be on mission with him in the church and in the world. And so I want to encourage you uh, to be where God wants you to be. And then for the last two weeks... Uh, we had a guest speaker come in, and we learned that we partner with God through generous giving. And this is a huge, huge part of partnering with God. And I want you to know, first of all, if you look on the front of your bulletin, you'll notice that last week as a part of our advanced offering, we collected right at $43,000 for this above the tithe offering. We still collected our tithes and offerings. That's not included in that 43 number. But I want you to know um, that our people made commitments that total right at 43000 And we're expecting that others will come in. We're expecting that number to go over $50,000. And so listen, one of the ways that we are partnering with God in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, is through this what? Generous giving, through this offering. And we've learned over the last couple of weeks that our giving starts with a tithe. By the way, the Bible talks about the tithe as something that we owe God. We just give it back to Him. Um, and then by His grace, we can grow in our level of giving and we can go above and beyond the tithe and really join God in all that He is doing. So we can partner with God through generous giving. That's a very big part. Well, today I want to kind of close this series out with a message that focuses on this main idea. Here's the main idea for today. We partner with God in building His kingdom when we persevere. Persevere is the fill-in there in ministry to the end. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever wanted to throw in the towel? <laughs> yeah. I mean, in fact, how many of you have thought about quitting every day, <laughs> right? Like finishing to the end. Like if we are not involved in the work, we're not going to be partners with God, right? And so today we're going to learn how important it is for us to stay in the work, to stick in there, to never give up, to not walk off the job, right? To endure to the end regardless of our circumstances in life. Now, many of you uh, will recognize this famous basketball coach, but uh, Jimmy Valvana inspired us many years ago in 1993. He died and went on to be with the Lord. But before his death, many of you know he had an incredible battle with cancer, and he was a great inspiration to a lot of people. I want you to take a look at this video and just kind of hear his words of inspiration, because his words actually kind of match what Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Listen to this videotape. Nobody had more fun than I did in the 10 years that I was fortunate enough to be able to stand in that corner right before every game and thank God for the opportunity to coach at North Carolina State University. Let me... Let me tell you what the 83 team means to me. They're special, not because they put that banner up there. They're special because they taught me and the world so many important lessons. Number one, hope. What does hope mean? Hope that things can get better in spite of adversity. The 83 team taught us that when Derek Wittenberg went down. And everybody said we couldn't, and there was no way we could win. And a kid named Ernie Myers stepped in, and we lost a few, then we won a few, and then Derek came back, and every sports writer in America said that, uh, I remember my favorite quote was that uh, trees would tap dance, elephants would drive the Indianapolis 500, and Orson Welles would skip breakfast, lunch, and dinner before NC State figured out a way to win the NCAA tournament. Well. This team taught me that elephants are going to be driving in the Indianapolis 500 someday. They taught me about hope. The 83 team taught me about dreaming and the importance of dreams, because nothing can happen if not first a dream. If you have a, someone with a dream, if you have a motivated person with a dream and a goal and a vision, if you have someone who never gives up, who has great hope, and that team taught me the persistence, the idea of never, ever quitting. Don't ever give up. Don't ever stop fighting. Amen. 
How many of you remember that speech? A lot of us d- d- do remember. Well, Jimmy V was an inspiration to a lot of us as we watched him fight cancer, right? A deadly disease. In fact, many times he gave inspirational speeches like at the ESPYs and beyond um, when he really wasn't even able to stand, right? And, and what I want you to understand is that in the sports world, right, um, he, he realized something very important, right? And that was persevering where? All the way to the, to the end. Well, guess what? As we look at our passage today in 2 Corinthians 4, the Apostle Paul gives us another inspirational um, a speech, if you will, to invite or to encourage us to do what? Never, ever give up. Let's say that together. Never, ever give up. We can do better. Let's do it. Never, ever give up. Never, ever give up. How many of you would just acknowledge there's a lot of give up in us? Right? Let's just be honest about that. And Paul understood that. And that's why, really, he's writing this passage. In fact, who endured more suffering than the great Apostle Paul? In fact, the Apostle Paul's life, really, um, is an inspiration to all of us as Christians, right? To never give up, to persist to, persist to the very, very end. And, and so, let me just kind of break down uh, this chapter for you. Here's the first thing that we learn uh, in chapter, and it's actually in chapter 4, verse 1. We, we learn this, we endure to the end. How can we get there? How can we persevere? We can endure to the end because we recognize Our ministry assignment is the result of God's mercy. And I want you to look at verse 1. Walk with me through this verse. Paul says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry. In other words, did Paul deserve to be used by God? The answer is, come on church, no. Paul recognized something very important that you and I need to recognize. Not only does God save undeserving people, God also uses undeserving people. In other words, think about it for just a moment. God allows us, God allows the Apostle Paul, we all are undeserving people. What does he allow undeserving people to do? To serve him. Now, I want you to let that kind of sink in for a second, right? And and because oftentimes we, we think that we actually deserve okay, salvation. We actually think we deserve the opportunity to serve, but we don't. In fact, Paul reassures us. Look what he says. He says, through God's mercy, we have this ministry. In other words, God has given us a privilege. In other words, we don't deserve to be able to work with God to build his kingdom, but he's given us this privilege, even though we don't deserve it. And look what he says. And because of that, look what he says, we do not lose heart. Isn't that interesting? Paul really lays out really two simple things here that enabled him not to lose his motivation, not to quit early, not to walk off the job. You see, Paul had personally received the mercy of God. Many of you are familiar with his testimony. You remember who he was before he was converted and and saved? His name was Saul. And who was he? He was a terrorist. He was, a, he, was a, he was a person who was persecuting the church. And in fact, he murdered. He had, he had much to do with uh, the death of many early believers. He was trying to stop the New Testament church. You remember in the book of Acts, on his way to Damascus, he's breathing out murderous threats against believers. He had taken part of the stoning against Stephen, one of those first early deacons. Remember, the Bible says that the apostle the Paul, who at that time name was Saul, was struck down, right? And he was blinded for three days. You remember that story? And uh, the resurrected of Christ came and engaged him, encountered him. And during those three days, what did Paul see when he was blind? First, he saw he was sinful. By the way, you know what Paul thought at that time? He thought, hey, he's doing the right thing. He thought he was actually serving God by killing Christians. How many of you have ever found yourself 
doing something that you thought was right, but later on you found out it was not right, right? Paul discovers that about himself. Oh no, the, the very God who I'm saying I love and serve, that's the very God that I'm persecuting and I'm going against. And so he's radically converted as he comes to know Jesus Christ. But not only that, listen, not only did God save Paul by his mercy, he also gave him a ministry assignment. Now, this th think about this for a moment. This would be like taking the two gentlemen who brutally and, quite frankly, an act of evil killed one of our Wake County deputies a few weeks back. This would be like God saving them and then calling them to the mission field. That's what type of person Paul was when he was called Saul. Now, we often think that we're not too bad, that we don't need God to save us. But we're all like Saul. We're all like those two men who murdered, ruthlessly murdered that guy. We are sinners, and we don't deserve salvation. And listen, here's what Paul is understanding. Here's why Paul finished to the end. Because he knew he didn't deserve salvation, but God gave it to him. Here's why Paul didn't quit and walk off the job. Because he knew he didn't deserve to serve God. But what did God do? God who's rich in mercy did what? Assigned him ministry. And by the way, I don't deserve to be up here. You don't deserve any ministry assignment, do we? And I just want you to let that sink in. God allows undeserving people to be saved. God allows undeserving people to serve him. And Paul is saying, if you never forget that you don't deserve this, you certainly won't walk off the job, right? It's a great privilege to be able to serve. And that should keep you in the fight to the very end. And then in verses 2 through 6, Paul kind of transitions and he teaches us a second very important principle. He teaches us this, that we as Christians must embrace the demands of gospel ministry. Look, as we go into living for Christ, we need to understand what does that demand of us. We know we've got to rely on God's mercy for effectiveness. Listen, if you think that you're going to be effective in your own strength, you're going to find out something very different. So look what Paul teaches us here. He teaches us we got to embrace the demands of gospel ministry. Let me just give you a few of the demands of gospel ministry that are listed in verses 2 through 6. The first one is this. Paul says we got to learn to live a life of honesty and integrity. Look at verse 2. He says, rather, instead of giving up, instead of walking out and not serving anymore... We have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the Word of God. Now, let me just tell you what's happening. There are people in the church of Corinth who are accusing Paul of being shameful and deceitful. They really are. That's why he's addressing it. Now, now can you imagine accusing someone who suffered so much for the gospel of being greedy? Of, of being in the ministry for money? <laughs> And Paul says, no, 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 we, we've renounced all of that. Like, we've renounced all secret and hidden greed. That we have no personal selfish ambitions. We have no um, uh, desires or methods that are, above, that are below reproach. We're, we're not a trying to trick anybody in believing. How many of you have seen preachers trying to deceive people like by selling holy water or selling a, a prayer class? How many of you have seen these people, right? Pa Paul saying, I'm not one of those guys. I'm speaking plainly. I'm speaking honestly. I'm not trying to get rich. In fact, I'm not, I'm not trying to, what, propel myself into some place. I am what? I am a servant of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is saying, listen, the God, if you're going to be in gospel ministry, you're going to have a live a life of honesty and integrity. And then he goes on to say, look what he says next. He says, we, we do not, nor do we distort the Word of God. In other words, we don't take the Bible and make it sound or make it say what we want it to say. We don't preach or teach part of the Bible and skip over other parts that are hard. We never falsify the gospel. In other words, Paul is saying, listen, I haven't created my own gospel. I'm not teaching something that, that kind of puffs me up or builds me up. I'm giving you the Word of God just like it is. I'm speaking to you plainly. 
He goes on to say, on the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly. I love that. Paul says, listen, this, this is what it means. When we're in gospel ministry, we're to set forth God's truth, what? Plainly. No selfish agendas. I'm not trying to build my kingdom. I'm not trying to have a big church. I just want see, I just want to see people be brought into the kingdom of God. That's what Paul is saying. We've got to embrace that. And, and listen, and, and Paul really speaks clearly here to the Word of God because some were accusing him of skipping these parts and, and not, 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 not allowing the law of Moses in. And, and Paul says, no, I've never falsified the Bible. I don't add my ideas to the Bible. We never take away portions of Scripture. We never add parts to it. And can I just tell you this? We don't keep silent about the parts that we don't like. Do you know there are churches right here in Wake County? They're silent about parts that, that they don't like. And some of them are very public about some of them uh, things that are not in the Bible. Like, 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 like the Bible does not support sexual sin of any kind. Heterosexual, homosexual, it doesn't. And you can't say that and be true to the Word of God. You can say that we live in a broken world and there's all types of brokenness, including sexual brokenness. You can say God loves a person who struggles with sexual sin. You can say God can redeem that person. God can restore that person. But you can't say it's the way of God to live that way. Not in speak plainly, not in to be honest. You can't do it. And so Paul says we've got to embrace these demands. And the first demand, we just got to live honestly before our people. We've got to be a people of integrity. I love what Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2 says. It says, do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it. But keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. In other words, we're warned over and over in Scripture not to add to Scripture, not to take away from Scripture. By the way, this is why I'm so excited about this Wednesday night. If you have never been in a class where someone helps you learn how to interpret the Bible rightly, this Wednesday night, I'll be glad, to, I'll be glad for you to come and be a part of that. Can I just tell you this? If you misinterpret the Bible, what do you have? You have the Word of man. And the word of man cannot change anything. The word of man is sinking sand. But if you interpret the Bible rightly, what do you have? You have the word of God. And the word of God is what? It is powerful. It is powerful enough to convert the unbelieving heart. It is powerful enough to overcome the temptations in our life. It is powerful enough for us to use it to combat sin in our life. You know what the word of God is powerful enough? It can hammer out sin in your life. I need that. What about you? I needed it yesterday watching the NC State play. I needed, I needed the word of God to hammer my tongue. God even allows undeserving teams to win, don't he? He does. And I'm a Pack fan. Sorry to say it. We must live, though, with a life of honesty and integrity. Here's the second thing. I want you to see what Paul says. The second demand of ministry is this. We must proclaim Christ and serve others. Please get this. The focus of gospel ministry is not you or me. It's not us. It's not this church. The focus is Jesus Christ. It's centered on Christ. That's who we proclaim. But it's focused on who? Others, not self. Say that with me, that last part. Not self. Say it louder. Not self. The ministry is not about me. It's not about building me. And Paul drives that point home. Look, look at this uh, verse 3 and beyond. He says, and even if our gospel is veiled. In other words, Paul is saying when he preaches the gospel, sometimes people don't get it. It's hidden. It's just like they, they're blind to it. He says, it is veiled to those who are perishing. These are unbelievers. This is very important. Watch verse 4. The God of this age. Who's the God of this age? Satan. The God of this age has blinded the minds of who? Unbelievers. 
So listen, when I'm preaching the gospel, it is not how clever I am in my preaching that convinces you. No, no, no. I can't do anything. It's the Spirit of God that convinces you that this is truth. Are you with me? So listen, I can't talk you into it. Only the Holy Spirit can convince you of truth. And, and Paul was saying, as I'm preaching the gospel, it's evident that some people can't see it. They're blind. I'm preaching as clear as I can. I'm setting it forth before them very plainly. But they're, they're blinded. Why? Because the God of this world is at work. What is Satan trying to do to your kids, parents? He's trying to cut Cover their eyes so that they can't see, so that they can't see the truth about Jesus. Look what he says next. He says, The God of this earth age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. In other words, so that they can't see Jesus for who Jesus is, God's Son, the promised Messiah of all, who would come and die for the sins of the world. This is incredibly important for us to grasp. We preach Christ and we serve others. And so listen, the gospel is not social in nature. It's spiritual. Let me explain what I mean. <clears throat> Gospel-centered ministry is much more than feeding the hungry. It's much more than clothing the naked. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing that. We should be compassionate and we should want people to have the basic necessities. But if we feed the hungry and we don't give them Jesus, we're sending them to hell with a full stomach. The gospel, if it's going to be gospel ministry, we have to proclaim Jesus Christ as God's what? Son who came and what? Lived a perfect life and died in our place. The promised Messiah from Genesis 3. Now let me just kind of help you see this. I want you to go back. Can you hit rewind? Hit rewind and we're going to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. And there we are. We're in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Are you there? Are you with me? And God says to Adam and Eve, you can enjoy everything, but don't eat from this what? Don't eat from the fruit of the tree of good and knowledge, right? Of good and evil. Right? Don't, 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 the tree of knowledge. Don't eat of it. Now, I want you to understand, God's not trying to be a God that throws out a lot of rules for us to follow. God is a good God, a good daddy who's saying, I'm warning you, don't do this. He's saying, here's what God is saying, please believe me. Believe me when I tell you, don't eat of that tree, because if you eat of that tree, what's going to happen, church? You shall surely say it loud. Die. God is saying, believe me first. And then there's another person that comes into the garden, deceiving Satan himself, who was an angel who had rebelled against God and who was cast out of the presence of God in heaven. He comes in the form of a serpent, and what does he do? He goes to Adam and Eve, and he says... Please believe me. You actually can eat from that tree. And if you do, you won't die. God is lying to you. Here's what he's saying. Believe me. What did Adam and Eve do? They believed Satan. How do we know? Because they did what Satan said. You can't say you believe God and not do anything for him. Do what he says. You, you, you can't say I, I, I believe in tithing and not do it. You, you can't do that. That's hypocritical. But I want you to see from that moment. Satan has been blinding the eyes of people. He's been saying, believe me, yes, you can marry someone of the same sex. Yes, you can do this. Yeah, Satan is saying, oh, just believe me. Oh, marriage can be between whoever, whenever, however. Believe me. Do you see how Satan has corrupted God's design? And man allowed that because man refused to do what? Believe God first. Some of us need to hear this this morning. We're believing God or we're believing Satan, one or the other. Don't, don't make no mistake about it. 
When you say, well, you know, I, I don't quite believe what God is saying. I'm going to do this. Well, and you try that. Guess what? The consequences are coming. I say all that to you to say is because we are serving others. And how do we serve others? By declaring that Jesus became a servant for us. That Jesus came and sacrificed his life. He suffered daily and then he sacrificed himself on the cross bearing our punishment for sin. Jesus gave himself for our sakes. And so now Paul says we're to to give ourselves to Jesus on, the, on behalf of other people. We serve others because Jesus first did what? Served us. Are you convinced? I want to ask you again, are you convinced that Jesus saved you? Because the enemy says you're not. <laughs> The enemy wants to blind you. And that's what Paul is saying here in a very powerful way. Paul's saying not only do we have to live a life and ministry of honesty and integrity, we've got to proclaim the gospel. Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. And we need to understand that we have an enemy who's trying to blind the hearts of people that we speak to. And so this week I was kind of comforted when God said, relax, Ed, just relax. You don't save anybody. Set forth the word of God plainly and then let the people decide what they're going to do. Are they going to believe me and do what I say? Or are they going to believe Satan and do what he says? This is the battle that you and your kids are in. Kids, I want to say something to you. You need to start out early believing God. And our older people in the room will say, it'll save you a lot of heartache and headache. Amen? It will. We're sharing that to you as an encouragement. But then look, let me just give you this third thing real quick that Paul says is a demand of gospel ministry. We must have a genuine personal conversion experience. All right? This is very important. Gospel ministry demands the very presence of God dwelling in our hearts. Look at verse 6. I love verse 6. This is incredible. Look at verse 6. Follow with me. It says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness. When did God say that? In the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1. Remember, there was darkness, and God said, Let's say it, Let there be. Man, that's power when God says it. And there was what? There was light, there was night and day, there was, there, was, there was form and order to creation. I'm telling you, when God says, let there be light, there's power. The power of creation follows. And Paul is saying, just like God said, let there light, and there was light, there was day and night, and there was order. There was a creation that had some type of order to it. Look what he says. He says this. He says, he also made his light shine where? Please follow along with me, because it's not my words. It's God's words that change you. His light to shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. In other words, just as God said, let there be light and there was creation. When Jesus Christ was born, God said, let there be light and there there can be recreation. We can be made new. Right? Jesus was born as the what? The light of the world. So that we could see truth. We could see the glory of God was on Jesus. We could see by the Holy Spirit illuminating and shining a light on Jesus. This is no ordinary man. This is the Son of God. This is God in the flesh. This is Jesus the Christ. The promised Messiah. This is the one we've been waiting for. This is the one who holds our future in his hands. This is the one who's been sent from heaven to die on the cross to bear our penalty for sin so that by faith in him we might be declared what righteous and be forgiven this is no ordinary man when Jesus was born God said let there be light imagine human the human world being developed enveloped by a cloud of darkness, and God, when Jesus was born, blasted a hole of light in there, and there there's hope for deliverance out of darkness and sin. Until you have seen the glory of God in Jesus Christ, you understand who he is and what he's done. 
you're not a Christian, you're just religious. And Paul says, this light, the light of the glory of God in Jesus Christ was shown in our hearts. We know who he is. And we turned from our sin and we trusted him. And we now have had a genuine conversion experience. The gospel demands a genuine conversion experience. The gospel demands us to turn to Christ. And listen, the enemy does everything to blind your children and grandchildren's eyes and hearts from the glory of Jesus. Because listen, here's how you pray for a lost person. Oh God, would you shine your light, the light of Jesus Christ, in the heart of my son, in the heart of my grandchildren son oh god would you shine your light the light of jesus christ in the heart of my friend my neighbor who's lost oh god would you help him see what right now he's not able to see like paul we must have a personal conversion experience and i want to ask you do you have one can you talk about it Sometimes I'm talking to people and I'll ask them, hey, are you a believer? Like, oh yeah, we go to church. That's not what I ask you. When did God shine the light of his glory in your heart and you recognize Jesus and trust him and ask him to come into your life and save you? When was that? Paul says the gospel demands we live lives of honesty, integrity. We don't try to trick people. We don't try to build our own kingdom and the, the, Paul says that we proclaim Christ and we serve other people. And listen, we serve other people by giving them Christ, not just giving them food. And Paul says we must have a genuine personal conversion experience. This light of Christ must have shone in our hearts. And then listen, here's, here's how he closes this chapter. He closes this chapter by just teaching us this last principle. We must rely on God to sustain us through life's trials and the challenges of ministry. How many of you would re recognize this morning that without God, we're in big trouble? We're in big trouble. Paul says in verses 7 through 18 that if we don't rely on God, who now lives in us to sustain us, we'll never make it through the many trials of life. We'll never make it through the many challenges of ministry. And in verses 7 through 9, I love this. He says, the presence and power of God will sustain us. Listen to me. Look at verse 7. Follow the scripture. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. What is the treasure? Now that we've had a genuine conversion experience, we now have the Holy Spirit, the presence of Christ. We have the treasure of the gospel, Jesus himself, the spiritual presence of Jesus. Where does Jesus dwell? In our, in our lives, in our hearts. We now are temples of the Holy Spirit, right? Right? Our body is the temple. Who lives inside? I love that old hymn. I know you ask me how I know he lives. What's the old hymn, ladies and gentlemen? He lives for he lives within my heart. We have this treasure. We have the Holy Spirit in jars. Of, what are the jars of clay? That's our earthly body. Our bodies are earthly and frail. They can break it. No, they're wearing down. Listen, because of Christ's death and resurrection from the cross, the giving of the Holy Spirit, now we get the full presence of God in us. And so listen, wherever you go in life, you take God with you. Going into sexual sin, guess what you're taking with you? Taking the Holy Spirit with you in it. Because the Spirit dwells in us. And Paul's reminding us that we have the presence and we have the power of God in our earthly body, in this jar of clay, after the conversion experience. We're never going to be alone. God says that he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He says we have this treasure now because of the, our conversion experience in jars of clay, our earthly body. And why is that? To show that it is the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. In other words, guess what? God dwells in us to show people around us us, that it's him doing the work in us not us that's what he's saying god enters our bodies after salvation our earthly vessels 
so that we might overcome all the weaknesses of this world. How many of you recognize the weaknesses of your frail body? The point is this, the treasure of God's presence is the treasure of God's presence is now dwelling within our earthly vessel. Someone should say amen. Thank you, Lord. Let me tell you how that means practically. That means when I send my daughter somewhere off to school, I know that she doesn't go by herself. I know that she has the presence of God with her. She has the power of God with her because she has had the light of God's glory shining in her heart. She's had this true conversion. So I may not be with her all the time, but who is with her all the time? This treasure, the Holy Spirit. That's why God gets the credit and not us, because it's not us, it's Him. Amen? And then look at verse 8. He says, we're hard-pressed on every side. Anybody feel like that right now? But we're not crushed. You know why you're not crushed? Because God dwells in your heart. If you were by yourself, you would be crushed. He goes on to say, but we're perplexed. Look, we're looking at things around us, and we don't understand everything that's happening. How many of you understand everything? We're perplexed. We don't know everything that God's doing. We're somewhat confused at times, but we're not in despair. <laughs> he hadn't left us in the dark completely. And he says, we're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're not struck down. We're not destroyed. In other words, he's saying God's presence and power is in us, and it's demonstrated in all of these ways. And so we ought to give him all the glory and the credit. And then in verses 10 through 12, he tells us that we can sustain and we can finish to the end if we learn to die daily to self. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. What in the world does that mean? It means that like Jesus, who died daily to self, we too, as believers, empowered by the Holy Spirit, can say no to temptation. Did Jesus say no to temptation? Every time. Did Jesus deny his will in order to do his Father's will? Every time. Did Jesus struggle to conquer the pressures of temptation every day? Did he wrestle against the forces of evil and, and never give in to them every single moment? And Paul is saying, here's how you make it to the end. You say no to temptation like Jesus did. And you can't do it by yourself, but because we have this treasure in this jar of clay, because we have the Holy Spirit, we can say no. We can die to self every day in order that we may live unto Christ. He says you're dying to self so that you might live unto Christ. And that's what Paul is driving home. He says here we're sustained in this life when we say no to self. How many of you can testify to that? When you said yes to the flesh, how did it work? Didn't turn out well, did it? But when you said no to temptation, you resisted temptation by the Holy Spirit's power in your life. How did it turn out for you? You received life and fulfillment. And then notice verses 13 through 15 very quickly. Our faith in the future bodily resurrection will hold us. Now listen, this is great. Look at verse 13. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. With the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Look at verse 14. Because we know. In other words, even if the United States becomes a communist country and they begin to persecute us and kill us as Christians, guess what? We can still make it to the end. Look what he says. Because we know. That the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us up with Jesus and present us with you in his what? Paul says, I don't care if everything is lost. There's one thing that won't be lost. And that is our future bodily resurrection is secure. Amen? Right? And then in verses 16 through 17, he says, listen, we can make it to the end if we learn to daily renew our lives spiritually. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, he says, therefore, we do not lose heart. We don't throw, up, throw in the towel. We don't walk off the job. We don't quit. We never give up. 
Even though outwardly we're wasting away. Now anybody here this morning can testify that our bodies are getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Oh. Even though physically we're wearing down and we're wearing out. Look what he says. Yet inwardly we're being what? Look at the text. Renewed day by day. You say, well, how do we renew ourselves day by day inwardly? We draw near to God. Isn't that what James 4, 8 says? Come near to God and he will do what? He'll come near to you. This past week I was visiting with Miss Betty Murphy. Many of you know her. She's a champion in my eyes of the faith. Prayer warrior. Encourager. But now she's not mobile. She can't get up and go to the bathroom on her own. Everything's changed in her earthly vessel. You don't realize how bad she missed being here. And I was saying, sharing with her that even though she's immobile, that there's still ministry for her to do. What kind of ministry can she do? Say it louder. Isn't it interesting, the most important ministry, which is prayer, which is where we should start, there's never a time in our life that we can't do it. There'll be a time where I can't physically stand up and preach. I may lose my voice. I may not be able to speak to you. I, there, there are lots of things that we can do in ministry that one day we may not be able to do. But when it comes to prayer, there is never a time that you won't be able to do that. You can engage in the ministry of prayer even when you're not able to do anything else. And so I try my best to encourage her as she's encouraged me so many times through the years to never stop what? praying you know what she's praying for she's praying for you and she's praying for revival you know what she's praying for she's praying for an awakening you know why she's praying for awakening because the lives of your children and grandchildren depend on it she's praying and then listen there's one last thing Please lean in here because this is probably the most important thing in the whole text. Paul says we have to have an eternal perspective if we're going to make it to the end. Look at verse 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is what? Does everybody agree with me that there are two worlds? There's a physical world and there's a spiritual world. And that they're, look, 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 they're not the same. Listen, he says we fix our eyes not on what is seen. In other words... Oftentimes, how do we live as Christians? We live in the what? Worldly dimension. We only see the temporal. Everything in this world, like everything you build with your hands is going to rot and it's going down. He says, we fix our eyes not on what is seen. In other words, we, we, we have to have an eternal perspective. We don't look at the worldly dimension. We look at the spiritual dimension. And he says, but on what is unseen, the, the spiritual dimension. For what is seen is temporary. Everything that you see, go home to your house, look at everything. Wow, that's a beautiful chandelier we just bought. Wow, that's a beautiful. I'm just telling you, it's temporary. It's temporal. Everything. Paul says, for what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is what? It's eternal. Now listen carefully. The key to the Christian life is to live in the physical world. We're here, aren't we? Everybody say, yeah, we're here. We're here. The key is to live in the physical dimension, the world, but live according to the truths and values of the other world, the spiritual world, the eternal world. Now, I want you to understand these two worlds, the visible or the temporal world and the invisible or eternal world. I want you to hear me say something. They're in conflict with one another. 
So let me explain what I mean. In the visible world, truth is what man says it is. Right? But in the invisible world, the spiritual world, truth is what God says it is. In the visible world, emotions are reliable. What do, we tell, tell, what do we tell people? Well, if you feel like doing it, doing it. Do, your, your feelings are right. That's what, the, that's what the, the, the physical world says. But in the spiritual world, the spiritual world says your feelings are never reliable, hardly. And in the physical world, it says look, the goal, the end of man is, is happiness. Oh, I just want my kids to be happy. The spiritual world says the end goal is holiness. Do you see? These are two opposing worlds. And these two sets of beliefs cannot both be true. Listen to me carefully. It cannot be true that truth is what man it says and truth is what God. It cannot be true. They both cannot be true. So we have to choose between them. We have to choose whether we're going to believe what God says or what Satan says. Same choice that Adam and Eve had. And this is why Paul exhorts us not to focus on the physical and temporal, but on the spiritual world. So the reason is very clear. Because the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. He wants us to what? Have an eternal perspective. Now, let me give you a quote here, and then I want to wrap up with an illustration. Watch this. Max Anders says this. Unless we abandon ourselves to the eternal perspective. In other words, we cannot... Embrace the, the temporal perspective. What the world says, we have to reject. We have to accept the eternal perspective, what God says. We are likely to be disappointed, discouraged, and even defeated by God's unwillingness to bless our temporal plans. Please listen to this. The reason many Christians are mad with God is because they focus on the temporal and God doesn't bless their temporal plans. And they're mad at God. They say, well, God's not good, Jeff. I know you we sang about it. You said God is good and good all the time. But you know what? I, I had all these earthly plans. I had all these temporal plans. And I put it all together. And I got it all finished. And now I'm sick and dying of cancer. God, you're not fair. And they become discouraged. They begin to believe that God is not good. They believe, they believe that God's not fair because their focus is on the temporal. They're building the earthly and they're not even focused on the eternal. And, and Max Anders remind us, listen, we'll get discouraged. We'll be disappointed. We'll feel defeated. And look, let me just tell you something. We will quit on God when he doesn't bless our temporal plans unless our focus is on the eternal. If we live focused on the temporal, we will waste our lives. Our kids will get a lot of money that we leave them. But spiritually speaking, we'll waste our lives. If we focus on the temporal, listen, we will get mad with God because God is not going to do what we want Him to do in the temporal. And so how are you going to finish? Do you know some people finish mad at God? And Paul would say it's because your perspective was on the temporal. You thought God owed you 85 years here on earth with three homes and everything and wonderful help. God don't know you that. In fact, God often works in people's early exits. To build his kingdom in big ways. How are you going to finish? I mean, Valvano's story inspires us a little bit. The Apostle Paul's story inspires the heck out of me. How many of you want to finish to the end? Listen to me carefully. There's a cosmic battle going on and you're in it. Who are you going to believe? Dad? How are you going to guide your family? Are you going to believe what God says? Or are you going to believe what the enemy says? 
What's the Holy Spirit saying to you this morning? Maybe he's convinced you of your need for salvation because you realize you've never had a personal conversion experience. If that's the case, I invite you to come. I'll be glad to help you and guide you through the process of getting saved and trusting Jesus. How many of you know God can, today's the day of salvation? We want you to be saved, amen? We don't want you to be deceived. God may have prompted you and done a different way. Maybe it's in this area of eternal perspective. Maybe your eyes are set on your 70 years here on earth. And completely oblivious to how your time here on earth can build eternity. Embrace an eternal perspective. And then you will realize now and in the future that God is good. We have no reason to be mad at God. He's a good, good God. Let's pray together. God, we love you and we need you. Your word is so purifying to me. It helps me so much. Thank you for it. And now, Lord, I just give these people to you, and I pray that your Holy Spirit will have your way. The truth is, Lord, we are available. We're available either for you or we're available for the enemy. I pray that you would guard our hearts from any form of deception. And we'd be fully available, Lord, for you and for your work. Build your kingdom through us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.